And Quiet Flows the Dawn by Mikhail Sholokhov continued. Yegor listened with an unusually serious expression to the reply and then sat down on his bare bottom in the grass, hiding his anxious face and struggling ineffectually to get his trembling leg into his trousers. The detachment was drawn up in the yard. The other Cossacks returned to their bathe, being joined soon after by the new arrivals. Gregor dropped down at his brother's side. The damp, crumbling clay of the dam smelt raw and deathly. He sat killing the bloodless, flaccid lice in the folds and hems of his shirt, and told his brother, Piotr, I'm dead in spirit. I'm like a man all but killed, as though I'd been between millstones. They've crushed me and spat me out. His voice was complainingly high-pitched, and the furrows, only now, with a feeling of anxiety, did Piotr notice them, darkened and streamed across his forehead. Why, what's the matter? Piotr asked as he pulled off his shirt, revealing his bare white body with the clean-cut line of sunburn around the neck. It's like this, Gregor said hurriedly, and his voice grew strong in its bitterness. They've set us fighting one another, but they don't come themselves. The people have become worse than wolves, evil all around you. I think to myself that if I was to bite a man, he'd go mad. Have you had to kill anyone? Yes, Gregor almost shouted, screwing up his shirt and throwing it underfoot. Then he sat clutching with his fingers at his throat as though choking with a stranded word, and gazed aside. Tell me, Piotr ordered, avoiding his brother's eyes. My conscience is killing me. I sent my lance through one man, in hot blood. I couldn't have done it otherwise. But why did I cut down the other? Well? It isn't well. I cut down a man, and I'm sick at heart because of him, the reptile. He comes to me in my dreams, the swine. Was I to blame? You're not used to it yet. That's what's wrong. Are you stopping with our company? Gregor asked abruptly. No, we are drafted to the 27th Regiment. Well, let's have a bathe. Gregor hastily pulled off his trousers and went to the edge of the dam. He was clearly older than when they last saw each other, Pyotr thought. Raising his hands, he dived into the water. A heavy green wave closed over him and billowed away. Gracefully cleaving the water, lazily moving his shoulders, he swam towards the group of Cossacks larking about in the middle. Pyotr was slow in removing the cross with the prayer sewn to it slung round his neck. He thrust the string under his pile of clothes, entered the water with timorous caution, wetted his breast and shoulders, then pressed forward with a groan and swam to overtake Grigor. They made for the opposite bank. The movement through the water cooled and soothed, and Grigor flung himself down on the bank and spoke restrainedly and without his previous passion. The lice have eaten me up, he remarked. If I was at home now, I'd fly as if I had wings, only to take one little peep. How are they all? Natalia is living with us. How are father and mother? All right, but Natalia still waits for you. She believes you will go back to her. Grigor snorted and silently spat out water. Pyotr turned his head and tried to look into his brother's eyes. You might send her a word in your letters. The woman lives only for you. What? Does she still want to tie up the broken ends? Well, hope springs eternal. She's a fine little woman, strict too. She won't let anybody play about with her. She ought to get a husband. Strange words from you? Nothing strange about them. That's how it ought to be. Well, it's your business. I shan't interfere. And how's Dunya? She's a woman, brother. She's grown so much this year that you wouldn't know her. No, Gregor said in astonishment. God's truth. She'll be getting married next, and we shan't even get our whiskers into the vodka. We'll be killed off, damn them. They lay side by side on the sand, bathing in the warm sun. Burying a beetle in the sand, Gregor asked, Heard anything of Oxenia? I saw her in the village just before war was declared. What was she doing there? She'd come to get some things of hers from her husband. Did you speak to her? Only past the time of day. She was looking well and cheerful. She seems to have an easy time at the estate. And what about Stepan? He gave her odds and ends all right, behaved decently enough. But you keep your eyes open. I've been told that when he was drunk he swore to put a bullet through you in the first battle. He can't forgive you. I know. 
I got myself a new horse. Piotr changed the conversation. Sold the bullocks for 180, and the horse cost 150. Not a bad one, either. What's the grain like? Good. They took us off before we could get it in. The talk turned to domestic matters, and the intensity of feeling passed. Grigor thirstily drank in Piotr's news of home. For a brief while, he was living there again, a simple and restive lad. They returned with a crowd of Cossacks to the yard. At the fence of the orchard, Stepan Astakhov overtook them. As he walked, he was combing his hair and adjusting it under the peak of his cap. Drawing level with Grigor, he said, Hello, friend. Hello. Gregor halted and turned to him with a slightly embarrassed, guilty expression on his face. You haven't forgotten me, have you? Almost. But I remember you, Stepan smiled and passed by without stopping. After sundown, a telephone message came from the divisional staff for Gregor's regiment to return to the front. The companies were assembled within fifteen minutes and rode off singing to close a breach made in the line by the enemy cavalry. As they said goodbye to each other, Piotr thrust a folded paper into his brother's hand. What's this? Grigor asked. I've written down a prayer for you. Take it. Is it any good? Don't laugh, Grigor. I'm not laughing. Well, goodbye, brother. Don't dash away in front of the rest. Death has a fancy for the hot-blooded ones. Look after yourself, Piotr shouted. And what about the prayer? Piotr waved his hand. For some time, the companies rode without observing any precautions. Then the sergeants gave orders for the utmost possible quiet, and for all cigarettes to be put out. Over a distant wood flew rockets adorned with tails of lilac smoke. During August, the 12th Cavalry Division took town after town by storm, and by the end of the month, they were deployed around the town of Kamienka Strumilova, the reconnaissance patrols reported that considerable forces of enemy cavalry were approaching the town. In the woods, along the roads, little battles broke out where the Cossack outposts came into collision with the enemy advance guards. During all the days since he saw his brother, Grigor Melyakov had sought to put an end to his painful thoughts and to recover his former tranquility of spirit, but he was unable. Among the last reinforcements from the second line of reservists, a Cossack from the Kazan district, Alexei Uryupin, had been drafted into Grigor's troop. Uryupin was a tall, round-shouldered man with an aggressive lower jaw and drooping kalmyk whiskers. His merry, fearless eyes were always smiling, and he was bald, with only scanty, ruddy hair around the edges of his angular cranium. On the very first day of his arrival, he was nicknamed Tufty. After fighting around Broda, the regiment had a few days' respite. Grigor and Uryupin were quartered in the same hut. One evening, after feeding their horses, they were smoking, their backs against a moss-grown, decrepit fence. Hussars were riding four abreast along the street. Dead bodies were littered in the yards, for fighting had occurred in the suburbs. The town was one immense destruction and loathsome emptiness in the colorful early evening hour. Suddenly, Uryupin remarked, You know, Melyakov, you're molting or something. What do you mean by molting? Grigor asked, his face clouding. You're all limp, as though you're ill, Uryupin explained. I'm all right, Grigor spat out, not looking at the other. You're lying. I've got eyes to see. Well, and what can you see? You're afraid. Is it death you fear? You're a fool, Grigor said contemptuously, staring at his fingernails. Tell me, have you killed anyone? Yes. What of it? Does it weigh on your mind? Weigh on my mind? Grigor laughed. Uryupin drew his saber from its sheath. Would you like me to chop your head off? He asked. What for? I can kill a man without sighing over it. I have no pity. Uryupin's eyes were smiling, but by his voice and the rapacious quiver of his mouth, Grigor realized that he meant what he said. You've got a soft heart, he added. Do you know this stroke? Watch. He selected an old birch tree in the hedge and went straight towards it, measuring the distance with his eyes. His long, venous arms, with their unusually broad wrists, hung motionless. Watch! He slowly raised his saber and suddenly swung it slantwise with terrible force. Completely severed four feet from the ground, 
The birch toppled over, its branches scraping at the window and clawing the walls of the hut. Did you see that? I'll teach you the stroke. You could cut a horse in two like that. It took Gregor a long time to master the technique of the new stroke. You're strong, but you're a fool with your saber. This is the way, Uryupin instructed him. Cut a man down boldly. Man is as soft as butter. Don't think about the why and the wherefore. You're a Cossack, and it's your business to cut down without asking questions. To kill your enemy in battle is a holy work. For every man you kill, God will wipe out one of your sins, just as he does for killing a serpent. You mustn't kill an animal unless it's necessary, but destroy man. He's a heathen, unclean. He poisons the earth. His life is like a toadstool. When Gregor raised objections, he only frowned and lapsed into an obstinate silence. Gregor noticed with astonishment that all horses were afraid of Uryupin. When he went near them, they would prick up their ears and bunch together as though an animal were approaching and not a man. On one occasion, the company had to attack over a wooded and swampy district and took to their feet, the horses being led aside into a dell. Uryupin was among those assigned to take charge of the horses, but he flatly refused. Uryupin, why the devil don't you lead away your horses? The troop sergeant flew at him. They're afraid of me. God's truth, they are, he replied. He never took his turn at minding the horses. He was kind enough to his own mount, but Gregor observed that whenever he went up to it, a shiver ran down the animal's back, and it fidgeted uneasily. Tell me, why are the horses afraid of you? Gregor once asked him. I don't know, he replied with a shrug of his shoulders. I'm kind enough to them. They know a drunken man and are afraid of him, but you're always sober. I have a hard heart, and they seem to feel it. You have a wolf's heart. Or maybe it's a stone you've gotten, not a heart at all. Maybe, Uryupin willingly agreed. The troop was dispatched on reconnaissance work. The evening previously, a Czech deserter from the Austrian army had informed the Russian command of a change in the disposition of the enemy forces and a proposed counterattack, and there was need for continual observation over the road along which the hostile regiments must pass. The troop officer left four Cossacks with the sergeant at the edge of a wood and rode with the others towards a town lying beyond the next rise. Grigor, Uryupin, Misha Koshevoy, and another Cossack were left with the sergeant. They lay smoking by a fallen pine whilst the sergeant watched the country through his binoculars. Half an hour they lay there, exchanging lazy remarks. From somewhere to the right came the incessant roar of gunfire. A few paces away, a field of ungathered rye, its ears emptied of grain, was waving in the wind. Gregor crawled into the rye and selected some still full ears, husked them, and chewed the grain. A group of horsemen rode out of a distant plantation and halted, surveying the open country, then set off again in the direction of the Cossacks. Austrians, surely, the sergeant exclaimed under his breath. We'll let them get closer and then send them a greeting. Have your rifles ready, boys, he added feverishly. The riders steadily drew closer. They were six Hungarian hussars, in handsome tunics, ornamented with white braid and piping. The leader, on a big black horse, held his carbine in his hands and was quietly laughing. Fire! the sergeant ordered. The volley went echoing through the trees. The hussars galloped in single file into the grain. One of them fired into the air. Uryupin was the first to leap to his feet. He sped off, stumbling through the rye, holding his rifle across his chest. Some hundred yards away, he found a fallen horse kicking and struggling, and a Hungarian hussar standing close by, rubbing his knee hurt in the fall. He shouted something to Uryupin and raised his hands in token of surrender, staring after his retreating comrades. All this had happened so quickly that Grigor hardly had time to take in what was occurring before Uryupin had brought back his prisoner. Off with it, Uryupin shouted at the Hungarian, roughly tearing at the hussar's sword. The prisoner smiled apprehensively and fumbled with his belt, only too willing to hand over his sword. But his hands trembled, and he could not manage to unfasten the clasp. Grigor cautiously assisted him, and the hussar, a young, fat-cheeked boy with a downy mustache just showing on the upper lip, thanked him with a smile and a nod of the head. 
He seemed glad to be deprived of the weapon, and fumbled in his pocket, pulled out a leather pouch, and muttered something, offering the Cossacks tobacco. He's treating us, the sergeant smiled, and felt for his cigarette papers. The Cossacks rolled cigarettes from the hussar's tobacco and smoked. The strong black tobacco quickly went to their heads. He must be escorted to the company. Who'll take him, boys? the sergeant asked, passing his eyes over his men. I will, Uryupin replied quickly. All right, off with you. The prisoner evidently realized what was to happen to him, for he smiled wryly, turned out his pockets, and offered the Cossacks some broken chocolate. Rusin ich, Rusin, nein Austrische, he stammered, gesticulating absurdly and holding out the chocolate. Any weapons? the sergeant asked. Don't rattle away like that, we can't understand you. Got a revolver? A bang-bang? The sergeant pulled an imaginary trigger. The prisoner furiously shook his head. He willingly allowed himself to be searched, his fat cheeks quivering. Blood was streaming from his torn knee. Talking incessantly, he tied his handkerchief around it. He had left his cap by his horse, and he asked permission to go and fetch it and his blanket and notebook, in which were photographs of his family. The sergeant tried hard to understand what he wanted, but at last waved his hand in despair. Off with him. Uryupin took his horse and mounted it. Adjusting his rifle across his back, he pointed to the prisoner. Encouraged by his smile, the Hungarian also smiled and set off at the horse's side. With an attempt at familiarity, he patted Uryupin's knee. But the Cossack harshly flung off his hand and pulled on the reins. The prisoner guiltily drew away from the horse and strode along with a serious face, frequently looking back at the other Cossacks. His lint-white hair stuck up vividly on the crown of his head. So he remained in Gregor's memory. His tunic flung open, his flaxen tuft of hair, and his confident, brave mien. Mielyakov, go and unsaddle his horse, the sergeant ordered, regretfully spitting out the end of his cigarette. Gregor went to the fallen animal removed the saddle, and then for some undefined reason picked up the cap lying close by. He smelt at the lining and caught the scent of cheap soap and sweat. He carried the horse's equipment back to the trees. Squatting on their haunches, the Cossacks rummaged in the saddlebags and stared at the unfamiliar design of the saddle. That tobacco he had was good. We should have asked him for some more, the sergeant sighed at the memory and swallowed down his spittle. Not many minutes had passed when a horse's head appeared through the pines, and Uryupin rode up. Why, where's the Austrian? You haven't let him go, the sergeant questioned him. He tried to run away, Uryupin snarled. And so you let him? We reached an open glade, and he... So I cut him down. You're a liar, Grigor shouted. You killed him for nothing. What are you shouting about? What's it to do with you? Uryupin fixed icy eyes on Grigor's face. What? Gregor's voice slowly rose, and he swung his arms round in readiness to grapple with Uryupin. Don't poke your nose in where it isn't wanted, understand? The other replied sternly. Gregor snatched up his rifle and threw it to his shoulder. His finger quivered as it felt for the trigger, and his face worked angrily. Now then, the sergeant exclaimed threateningly, running to him. His jostle preceded the shot, and the bullet cut a branch from a tree and went whistling into space. He tore the rifle out of Gregor's hands. Uryupin stood without changing his position, his feet planted apart, his left hand on his belt. Fire again, he remarked. I'll kill you. Gregor rushed towards him. Here, what's all this about? Do you want to be court-martialed and shot? Put your arms down, the sergeant commanded. Thrusting Gregor back, he placed himself with arms outstretched between the two men. You lie. You won't kill me, Uryupin smiled. As they were riding back in the dusk, Gregor was the first to notice the body of the hussar lying in the path. He rode up in front of the others, and reining in his horse, stared down. The man lay with arms flung out over the velvety moss, his face downward, his palms, yellow like autumn leaves, turned upward and open. A terrible blow from behind had cloven him in two, from the shoulder to the belt. The Cossacks rode past the body and on to the company headquarters, 
in silence. The evening shadows deepened. A breeze was driving up a black, feathery cloud from the east. From a swamp nearby came the stagnant scent of marsh grass, of rusty dampness and rot. A bittern boomed. The drowsy silence was broken by the jingle of the horse's equipment and the occasional knock of saber on stirrup or the scrunch of pine cones under the horse's hoofs. Through the glade, the dark, ruddy gleam of the departed sun streamed over the pine trunks. Uryupin smoked incessantly, and the fleeting spark of his cigarette lit up his thick fingers with their blackened nails firmly gripping the cigarette. The cloud floated over the forest, emphasizing and deepening the fading, inexpressibly mournful hues of the evening shadows on the ground. The following morning, an assault was begun on the next town. Flanked by cavalry, the infantry was to have advanced from the forest at dawn. Somewhere, someone blundered. The infantry regiments did not arrive in time. The 211th Sharpshooter Regiment was ordered to cross over to the left flank, and during the offensive movement initiated by another regiment, it was raked with fire from its own batteries. The hopeless confusion upset the plans, and the attack threatened to end in failure, if not in disaster. Whilst the infantry was thus being shuffled about, the order came for the 11th Cavalry Division to advance. The wooded and marshy land in which they had been held in readiness did not permit of an extended frontal movement, and in some cases the Cossacks had to advance in troops. The 4th and 5th companies of the 12th Regiment were held in reserve in the forest, and within a few minutes of the general advance, the roaring, rending sound of the battle began to reach their ears. The two companies were drawn up in a glade. The stout pine trunks hemmed them in and prevented their following the course of the battle. After the first few moments of shouting, a deep silence fell. All strained their ears. From time to time they caught an outburst of cheering. On the right flank, the Austrian artillery thundered away at the attacking forces. The roar was interspersed with the rattle of machine guns. Grigor glanced around his troop. The Cossacks were fidgeting nervously, and the horses were restive as though troubled by gnats. Uryupin had hung his cap on the saddle bow and was wiping his bald head. At Grigor's side, Misha Kashavoy puffed fiercely at his homegrown tobacco. All the objects around were distinct and exaggeratedly real as they appear after a night's unbroken watching. The companies were held in reserve for three hours. All the stocks of tobacco were exhausted, and the men were pining in expectation, when, just before noon, an orderly officer galloped up with instructions. The commander of the fourth company led his men off to one side. To Grigor it seemed that they were retreating rather than advancing. His own company was marched off and rode for some twenty minutes through the forest, the sound of the battle drawing nearer and nearer. Not far behind them a battery was firing. The shells flew overhead with a roar. The narrow forest paths broke up the company's formation, and they emerged into the open in disorder. About half a mile away, Hungarian hussars were sabring the team of a Russian battery. Company, form, the commander shouted. The Cossacks had not completely carried out the order when the further command came. Company, draw sabers into the attack, forward, a blue shower of blades. From a swift trot, the Cossacks broke into a gallop. Six Hungarian hussars were busily occupied with the horses of the field gun on the extreme right of the battery. One was dragging at the bits of the excited artillery horses, another was beating them with the flat of his sword, whilst the others were tugging and pulling at the spokes of the carriage wheels. An officer on a dock-tailed chocolate mare was superintending the operations. At the sight of the Cossacks he gave an order, and the hussars leapt to their horses. As Grigor galloped towards them, one foot momentarily lost its stirrup, and feeling himself insecure in his saddle, with inward alarm, he bent over and fished with his toe for the dangling iron. When he had recovered his foothold, he looked up and saw the six horses of the field gun in front of him. The outrider on the foremost, in a blood and brain spattered shirt, was lying over the animal's neck, embracing it. Grigor's horse brought its hoof down with a sickening scrunch on the body of a dead gunner. Two more were lying by an overturned case of shells. 
A fourth was stretched face downward over the gun carriage. A Cossack of Gregor's troop was just in front of him. The Hungarian officer fired at almost point-blank range, and the Cossack fell, his hands clutching and embracing the air. Gregor pulled on his reins and tried to approach the officer from the right, the better to use his saber. But the officer saw through his maneuver and fired under his arm at him. He discharged the contents of his revolver and then drew his sword. Three smashing blows he parried dexterously. Gregor reached at him yet a fourth time, standing in his stirrups. Their horses were now galloping almost side by side, and he noticed the ashen-gray, clean-shaven cheek of the Hungarian and the regimental numbers sewn on his collar. With a feint, he drew off the officer's attention and, changing the direction of his stroke, thrust the point of his saber between the Hungarian's shoulder blades. He aimed a second blow at the neck, just at the top of the spine. The officer dropped his sword and reins from his hands and straightened up, then toppled over his saddle bow. Feeling a terrible relief, Gregor lashed at his head and saw the saber smash into the bone above the ear. A fearful blow at his head from behind tore consciousness away from Gregor. He felt a burning, salty taste of blood in his mouth and realized that he was falling. From one side, the stubbled earth came whirling and flying up at him. The heavy crash of his body against the ground brought him momentarily back to reality. He opened his eyes. Blood poured into them. A trample passed his ears and the heavy breathing of horses. For the last time, he opened his eyes and saw the dilated nostrils of horses and someone's foot in a stirrup. Finished, the comforting thought crawled through his mind like a snake, a roar, and then a black emptiness. Chapter 5 In the middle of August, Eugene Lisnitsky decided to apply for a transfer from the Ottoman's lifeguard regiment to one of the Cossack regular army regiments. He made his formal application, and within three weeks received an appointment, as he desired. Before leaving Petersburg, he wrote to his father, informing him of the step he had taken and asking his blessing. The train for Warsaw left Petersburg at 8 p.m. Lisnitsky took a drozhki and drove to the station. Behind him, Petersburg lay in a dove-blue twinkle of lights. The station was clamorous with soldiers. He settled down into his compartment, removed his sword belt and coat, and spread his Cossack blanket over the seat. By the window sat a priest with the lean face of an ascetic. Brushing the crumbs from his hempen beard, he offered some curd cake to a swarthy girl sitting in the seat opposite him. As Eugene dozed off, he heard the priest's voice as though coming from a distance. It is a miserable income my family gets, you know, so I'm off as a chaplain to the forces. The Russian people cannot fight without faith. And you know, from year to year the faith increases. Of course, there are some who fall away, but they are among the intelligentsia, and the peasant holds fast to God. The priest's bass voice failed to penetrate further into Eugene's consciousness. After two sleepless nights, a refreshing sleep came to him. He awoke when the train was a good twenty-five miles outside Petersburg. The wheels clattered rhythmically, the carriage swayed and rocked in a neighboring compartment someone was singing. The lamp cast slanting lilac shadows. The regiment to which Lisnitsky was assigned had suffered considerable losses and had been withdrawn from the front to be remounted and its complement made up. The regimental staff headquarters were at a large village called Biryaznyagi. Eugene left the train at some nameless halt. At the same station, a field hospital was detrained. Eugene inquired the destination of the hospital from the doctor in charge and learnt that it had been transferred from the southwestern front to the sector in which his own regiment was engaged. The doctor spoke very unfavorably of his immediate supervisors, cursed the divisional staff officers uphill and down dale, and tearing his beard, his eyes glowing behind his pince-nez, poured his jaundiced anger into the ears of his fortuitous acquaintance. "'Can you take me to Biriznyagi?' Eugene interrupted him. "'Yes, get into the trap, subaltern,' he agreed, and familiarly, twisting the button on Eugene's coat, went on with his complaints. Dusk was falling as the field hospital approached Biriznyagi. 
The wind ruffled the yellow stubble. Clouds were massing in the west. At their height, they were a deep violet black, but below they shaded into a tender, smoky lilac. In the middle, the formless mass, piled like flows against a river dam, was drawn aside. Through the breach, the flood of sunset rays poured in a strong orange, spreading in a spurting fan of light and weaving a bacchanalian spectrum of colors below the gap. A dead horse lay by the roadside ditch. On one of its hoofs, flung weirdly upward, the horseshoe gleamed. Jumping down from the trap, Lisnitsky stared at the carcass. The orderly with whom he was riding explained, It's overeaten itself, got among the grain. There it lies, and no one troubles to bury it. That's just like the Russians. The Germans are different. And how do you know? Eugene asked with unreasoning anger. At that moment he was filled with hatred for the orderly's phlegmatic face with its suggestion of superiority and contempt. The man was gray and dreary like a stubble field in September. He was in no way different from the thousands of peasant soldiers whom Eugene had seen on his way to the front. They all seemed faded and drooping, Dullness stared in their gray eyes, and they strongly reminded him of well-worn, long-minted copper coins. I lived in Germany for three years before the war, the orderly replied unhurryingly. In his voice was the same nuance of superiority and contempt that showed in his face. Hold your tongue, Lisnitsky commanded sternly, and turned away. They drove on. The colors faded in the west, sucked into the clouds. Behind them, the leg of the dead horse stuck up like a wayside cross bereft of its arm. As Eugene was staring back at it, suddenly a stream of rays fell on the horse and lit up with an orange gleam. The leg, with its sorrel hair, unexpectedly blossomed like a marvelous, leafless branch. As the field hospital drove into Biriznyagi, it passed a transport of wounded soldiers. An elderly white Russian, the owner of the first wagon, strode along at his horse's head, the hempen reins gathered in his hands. On the wagon lay a Cossack with bandaged head. He was resting on his elbow, but his eyes were closed wearily as he chewed grain and spat out the black husks. At his side a soldier was stretched out. Over his buttocks his torn trousers were horribly shriveled and taut with congealed blood. He was cursing savagely, without lifting his head. Lisnitsky was horrified as he listened to the intonation of the man's voice, for it sounded exactly like a believer fervently muttering prayers. On the fifth wagon, three Cossacks were comfortably seated. As Lisnitsky passed, they stared silently at him, their harsh faces showing no sign of respect for an officer. The commander of Lisnitsky's new regiment had his headquarters in the house of a priest. The place was very quiet and slack, like all staff headquarters situated away from the front line. Clerks were bent over a table. An elderly captain was laughing down the mouthpiece of a field telephone. The flies droned about the window, and distant telephone bells buzzed like mosquitoes. An orderly conducted Eugene to the regimental commander's private room. They were met on the threshold by a tall colonel, who greeted him coldly, and with a gesture invited him into the room. As he closed the door, the colonel passed his hand over his hair with a gesture of ineffable weariness, and said in a soft, monotonous voice, The brigade staff informed me yesterday that you were on your way. Sit down. He questioned Eugene about his previous service, asked for the latest news from the capital, inquired about his journey, and not once during all their brief conversation did he raise his eyes to Lisnitsky's face. He must have had a hard time at the front. He looks mortally tired, Eugene thought sympathetically, as though deliberately to disillusion him, the colonel remarked, Well, lieutenant, you must make the acquaintance of your brother officers. You must excuse me, I haven't been to bed for three nights running. In this dead hole there's nothing to do except play cards and get drunk. Lisnitsky saluted and turned to the door, hiding his contempt behind a smile. He went out, thinking unfavorably over this first meeting with his commanding officer, and ironically jesting at the respect which the colonel's tired appearance had instilled in him. Eugene's division was allotted the task of forcing the river Stier, 
and taking the enemy in the rear. The operations to force the river were carried through brilliantly. The division shattered a considerable concentration of enemy forces on their left flank and reached their rear. The Austrians attempted to initiate a counteroffensive with the aid of cavalry, but the Cossack batteries swept them away with shrapnel, and the Magyar squadrons retreated in disorder, annihilated by flanking machine gun fire and pursued by the Cossack cavalry. Lisnitsky advanced with his regiment to the counterattack. The troop he commanded lost one Cossack killed and four wounded. One of them, a young hook-nosed Cossack, was crushed under his dead horse. He lay quietly groaning and beseeching the Cossacks riding past, Brothers, don't leave me. Get me free of the horse, brothers. His low, tortured voice sounded faintly, but there was not a sign of pity in the hearts of the other Cossacks, or if there were, a higher will drove them on relentlessly, forbidding them to dismount. The troop rode on at a trot, letting the horses recover their wind. Half a mile away, the scattered Magyar squadrons were in full retreat. Here and there among them appeared the gray-blue uniforms of the enemy infantry. An Austrian transport crawled along the crest of a hill, and the milky smoke of shrapnel hovered valedictorily above them. From the left, a battery was bombarding the transport, and its dull thunder rolled over the fields and echoed through the forest. The regiment halted for the night in a little village. The twelve officers were all crowded into one hut. Broken with fatigue, they lay down hungry to sleep. The field kitchen arrived only about midnight. Cornet Chuboff brought in a pot of soup, and within a few minutes the officers were eating greedily without exchanging a word making up for the two days lost in battle. After the late meal, their previous sleepiness passed, and they lay on their cloaks, talking and smoking. First, Lieutenant Kalmikov, a tubby little officer whose face as well as his name bore the traces of his Mongolian origin, gesticulated fiercely as he declared, This war is not for me. I've been born four centuries late. You know I shan't live to see the end of the war. Oh, drop your fortune-telling. It's not fortune-telling. It's my predestined end. I'm atavistic, and I'm superfluous here. When we were under fire today, I trembled with frenzy. I can't stand not seeing the enemy. The horrible feeling I get is equivalent to fear. They fire at you from several miles away, and you ride like a bustard hunted over the steppe. I envy those who fought in the old-time, primitive fashion, he continued, turning to Lisnitsky to thrust at your opponent in an honorable battle and to split him in two with your sword. That's the sort of warfare I understand. But this is the devil knows what. In future wars, there will be no part left for the cavalry to play. It will be abolished, another officer observed. But you can't replace men by a machine. You're going too far. I'm not referring to man, but to horses. Motorcycles or motor cars will take their place. I just can't imagine a motor squadron. That's all nonsense, Kalmakov interposed excitedly. An absurd fantasy. We don't know what war will be like in two or three centuries' time, but today, cavalry are... What will you do with the cavalry when there are trenches all along the front? Tell me that. They'll break through the trenches, ride across them, and make sorties far to the rear of the enemy. That will be the cavalry's task. Nonsense. Oh, shut up and let us get some sleep, someone demanded. The argument tailed away and snores took its place. Lisnitsky lay on his back, breathing the pungent scent of the musty straw on which he had spread his cloak. Kalmikov lay down at his side. You should have a talk with the volunteer Bunchuk, he whispered to Eugene. He's in your troop, a very interesting fellow. How? Eugene asked as he turned his back to Kalmikov. He's a Russianized Cossack. He's lived in Moscow as an ordinary worker, but he's interested in the question of machinery. He's a first-rate machine-gunner, too. Let's get to sleep, Lisnitsky replied. Eugene completely forgot Kalmikov's reference to Bunchuk, but the very next day, chance brought him into contact with the volunteer. The regimental commander ordered him to ride at dawn on reconnaissance work, and, if possible, to establish contact with the infantry regiment, which was continuing the advance on the left flank. Stumbling about the yard in the half-light and falling over the bodies of the sleeping Cossacks, Eugene found the troop sergeant and roused him. 
I want five men to go on a reconnaissance with me. Have my horse got ready, quickly. While he was waiting for the men to assemble, a stocky Cossack came to the door of the hut. Your Excellency, the man said, the sergeant will not let me go with you because it isn't my turn. Will you give me permission to go? Are you out for promotion or what have you done? Eugene asked, trying to recognize the man's face in the darkness. I haven't done anything. All right, you can come, Eugene decided. As the Cossack turned to go, he shouted after him, Hey, tell the sergeant, Bunchuk is my name, the Cossack interrupted. A volunteer? Yes. Recovering from his confusion, Lisnitsky corrected his style of address. Well, Bunchuk, please tell the sergeant, too. Oh, all right, I'll tell him myself. Lisnitsky led his men out of the village. When they had ridden some distance, he called, Volunteer Bunchuk, sir, please to bring your horse alongside me. Bunchuk brought his commonplace mount alongside Eugene's thoroughbred. What district are you from? Lisnitsky asked him, studying the man's profile. Nova Cherkas. May I be informed of the reason that compelled you to join up as a volunteer? Certainly, Bunchuk replied with the slightest trace of a smile. The unwinking gaze of his greenish eyes was harsh and fixed. I'm interested in the art of war. I want to master it. There are military schools established for that purpose. I want to study it in practice first. I can get the theory after. What were you before the war broke out? A worker. Where were you working? In Petersburg, Rostov, and the armament works at Tula. I'm thinking of applying to be transferred to a machine gun section. Do you know anything about machine guns? I can handle the Berthier, Madsen, Maxim, Hotchkiss, Vickers, Lewis, and several other makes. Oh, I'll have a word with the regimental commander about it, if you will. Lisnitsky glanced again at Bunchuk's sturdy, stocky figure. It reminded him of the Donside cork elm. And Quiet Flows the Dawn by Mikhail Sholokhov continued. Lisnitsky glanced again at Bunchuk's sturdy, stocky figure. It reminded him of the Donside cork elm. There was nothing remarkable about the man, not one line indicating distinction. All was ordinary, gray, commonplace. Only the firmly pressed jaws and the eyes meeting his distinguished him from the mass of other rank-and-file Cossacks around him. He smiled but rarely, his lips twisting into a bow, but his eyes grew no softer, and they retained their uncertain gleam. Coldly restrained, he was exactly like the cork elm, the tree of a stern, iron hardness that grows on the gray, loose soil of the inhospitable Don Earth. They rode in silence for a while. Bunchuk rested his broad palms on his iron-shod saddle-bow, Lisnitsky selected a cigarette, and as he lit it from Bunchuk's match, he smelt the pungent scent of horses sweat on the man's hand. The back of his hand was thickly covered like a horse's skin with brown hair, and Eugene felt an involuntary desire to stroke it. At a turn of the road into the forest stood a clump of friendly birches. Beyond them the eye was wearied with the joyless yellow of stunted pines, the straggling forest undergrowth and bushes crushed by Austrian transports. On the right, the artillery were thundering in the distance, but by the birches it was inexpressibly quiet. The earth was drinking in a rich dew. The grasses were turning rosy, flooded with autumnal colors that cried of the speedy death of color. Lisnitsky halted by the birches, and taking out his binoculars, studied the rise beyond the forest. A bee settled on the honey-colored hilt of his saber. Stupid, Bunchuk remarked quietly and compassionately. What is? Eugene turned to him. With his eyes, Bunchuk indicated the bee, and Lisnitsky smiled. Its honey will be bitter, don't you think? he observed. It was not Bunchuk that answered him. From a distant clump of pines, a piercing magpie stutter chattered the silence, and a spurt of bullets sped through the birches, sending a branch crashing onto the neck of Lisnitsky's horse. 
they turned and galloped back towards the village, urging on their horses with shout and whip. The Austrian machine gun rattled without intermission through its belt of bullets. After this first encounter, Lisnitsky had more than one talk with the volunteer Bunchuk. On each occasion he was struck by the inflexible will that gleamed in the man's eyes, and could not discover what lay behind the intangible secrecy that veiled the face of one so ordinary-looking. Bunchuk always spoke with a smile compressed in his firm lips, and he gave Eugene the impression that he was applying a definite rule to the tracking of a tortuous path. As he wished, he was transferred to a machine-gun detachment. A few days later, whilst the regiment was resting behind the front, Lisnitsky overtook him walking along by the wall of a burnt-out shed. Ah, volunteer Bunchuk, he called. The Cossack turned his head and saluted. Where are you going? Eugene asked. To the chief command. Then we're going the same way. For some time they walked along the street of the ruined village in silence. Well... Are you learning the art of war? Lisnitsky asked, glancing sidelong at Bunchuk, who was slightly behind him. Yes, I'm learning it. What do you propose to do after the war? Some will reap what is sown, but I shall see, Bunchuk replied. How am I to interpret that remark? You know the proverb, those who sow the wind shall reap the whirlwind? Well, that's how. But dropping the riddles... It's quite clear as it is. Excuse me, I'm turning to the left here. He put his fingers to the peak of his cap and turned off the road. Shrugging his shoulders, Lisnitsky stood staring after him. Is the fellow trying to be original? Or is he just someone with a bee in his bonnet? He wondered irritatedly as he stepped into the company commander's earth hut. Chapter 6 The second and third lines of reserves were called up together. The districts and villages of the dawn were depopulated, as though everybody had gone out to mow or reap the harvest. But a bitter harvest was reaped along the frontiers that year. Death caught away the laborers, and more than one straight-haired Cossack's wife sang of the departed one, Beloved mine, for whom have you deserted me? The darling heads were laid low on all sides. The ruddy Cossack blood was poured out, and glassy-eyed, unawakable, they rotted beneath the artillery dirge in Austria, in Poland, in Prussia. So the eastern wind did not carry the weeping of their wives and mothers to their ears. One pleasant September day, a milky gossamer web, fine and cottony, was floating over the village of Tatarsk. The anemic sun was smiling like a widower, the stern, virginal blue sky was repellently clean and proud. Beyond the dawn, the forest pined a jaundiced yellow. The ash gleamed pallidly. The oak dropped rare figured leaves. Only the fir remained screamingly green, gladdening the sight with its vitality. That day, Pantoliemon Prokofievich received a letter from the army on active service. Dunya brought it back from the post. As the postmaster handed it to her, he bowed, shook his old, bald pate, and deprecatingly opened his arms. Forgive me, for the love of God, for opening the letter. Tell your father I opened it. I badly wanted to know how the war was going. Forgive me, and tell Pantelyemon Prokofievich what I said. He seemed confused, and came out of his office with Dunya, muttering something unintelligible, Filled with foreboding, she agitatedly returned home and fumbled at her breast a long time for the letter. As she drew it out, she said breathlessly, The postmaster told me he had read the letter and that you mustn't be angry with him. The devil take him. Is it from Gregor? The old man asked, breathing asthmatically into her face. From Gregor or from Piotr? No, father, I don't know the writing. Read it, Ilinichna cried tottering heavily to the bench. Her legs were giving her much trouble these days. Natalia ran in from the yard and stood by the stove with her head on one side, her elbows pressed into her breasts. A smile trembled on her lips. She was continually hoping for a message from Gregor or the slightest reference to her in his letters in reward for her dog-like devotion and fidelity. "'Where's Darya?' Ilinichna whispered. 
Shut up, Pantaliemon shouted. Read it, he added, to Dunya. I have to inform you, she began. Then, slipping off the bench where she was sitting, she screamed, Father! Mother! Oh, Mama! Our Grishka! Oh, oh, Grishka's been killed! Entangled among the leaves of a half-dead geranium, a wasp beat against the window, buzzing furiously. In the yard, a chicken clucked contentedly. Through the open door came the sound of ringing, childish laughter. A shudder ran across Natalia's face, though her lips still wore her quivering smile. Rising, his head twitching paralytically, Pantoliemon stared in a frenetic perplexity at Dunya, who was rolling spasmodically on the floor. The communication read, I have to inform you that your son, Grigor Pantolievich Melyukov, a Cossack in the 12th Don Cossack Regiment, was killed on the 29th of August near the town of Kamienka Strumilova. Your son died the death of the brave. May that be your consolation in your irreplaceable loss. His personal effects will be handed to his brother, Pyotr Melyukov. His horse will remain with the regiment. Commander of the 4th Company, Lieutenant Polkovnikov, Field Army, 31st August, 1914. After the arrival of the letter, Pantoliemon seemed suddenly to wilt. He grew visibly older every day. His memory began to go, and his mind lost its clarity. He walked about with bowed back, his face an iron hue, and the feverish, oily gleam in his eyes betrayed his mental stress. He began to go gray, and the dazzling gray hairs swiftly patched his head and wove threads into his beard. He grew gluttonous, too, and ate much and ravenously. He hid the letter among the books under the icon. Several times a day he went into the porch to beckon to Dunya. When she came in, he would order her to get the letter and read it to him, fearfully glancing the while at the door of the kitchen where his wife was working. Read it quietly, to yourself like, he would wink cunningly. Choking down her tears, Dunya would read the first sentence, and then Pantoliemon, squatting on his heels, would raise his brown head. All right, I know the rest. Take the letter back and put it where you found it, quickly, or mother. And he would wink repulsively, his whole face contorted like burnt tree bark. Nine days after the Requiem Mass, the Melyukovs invited Father Visarion and their relations to the repast in memory of the fallen Gregor. Pantoliemon ate fast and ravenously, and the vermicelli hung on his beard in ringlets. Ilinichna, who had been anxiously watching him during the past few days, burst into tears. "'Father, what's the matter with you?' she whispered. "'Eh?' the old man fidgeted, raising his filmy eyes from his plate. Ilinichna waved her hand and turned away, pressing her handkerchief to her eyes. "'Father, you eat as though you had fasted for three days,' Daria said angrily, her eyes glittering. "'I eat? All right, I won't.' Pantoliemon replied, overcome with embarrassment. He glanced around the table then, pressing his lips together. Sitting with knitted brows, he lapsed into silence, not even replying to questions. "'You're torturing yourself needlessly, Prokofievich. What's the good of grieving so much?' Father Visarion attempted to rally him when the meal was ended. "'Gregor's death was a holy one. Don't be angry with God, old man.' Your son has received a crown of thorns for his Tsar and his fatherland. And you... it's a sin, and God won't pardon you. That's just it, Holy Father. That's my torture. Died the death of the brave. That's what his commander said. Kissing the priest's hand, the old man fumbled for the door latch, and for the first time since the arrival of the letter, he burst into tears, his body shaking violently. From that day he regained his self-control and recovered a little from the blow. Each licked the wound in her own way. When Natalia heard Dunya scream that Gregor was dead, she ran into the yard. I'll lay hands on myself. It's the finish of all things for me, her thought drove her on like fire. She struggled in Daria's arms and gladly swooned as an alleviation and postponement of the moment when consciousness would return and violently remind her of what had happened. She passed a week in dull oblivion, 
and returned to the world of reality changed, quieter, gnawed by a black impotence. An invisible corpse haunted the Melyukov's hut, and the living breathed in its moldering scent. On the twelfth day after the news of Gregor's death, the Melyukovs received two letters from Pyotr by the same post. Dunya read them at the post office, and sped like a stalk caught up by the wind, then swayed and stopped, leaning against a fence. She caused no little excitement in the village, and carried an indescribable feeling of agitation into the hut. Grishka's alive! Our dear's alive! she sobbed and cried, when still some distance away. Piotr has written, Grishka's wounded, but he isn't dead. He's alive, alive. In his letter, dated September 2nd, Piotr had written, Greetings, dear family. I must tell you that our Grishka all but gave up his soul to God, but now, glory be, he's alive and well, as we wish you, in the name of the Lord God, health and well-being. Close to the town of Kamienka Strumilova, his regiment was in battle, and in the attack, the Cossacks of his troop saw him cut down by a Hungarian hussar, and Griegor fell from his horse, and after that nobody knew anything, and when I asked them, they could tell me nothing. But afterwards, I learnt from Mishka Koshevoy that Griegor lay till night, but that in the night he came round and started crawling away. He crawled along, making his way by the stars, and came across one of our officers, wounded. He picked him up and dragged him for four miles and for this Griegor has been given the cross of St. George, and has been raised to the rank of corporal. His wound isn't serious, and Misha told me he would be back at the front soon. You must excuse this letter. I am writing in the saddle. In his second letter, Piotr asked his family to send him some dried cherries from their own orchard, and told them not to forget him, but to write more often. In the same letter he upbraided Griegor because, so he had been told, he was not looking after his horse properly, and Piotr was ashamed, as the horse was really his. He asked his father to write to Gregor, and said he had sent a message to him that if he did not look after the horse, he would give him one on the nose that would draw blood, even if he had got the cross of St. George. Old Pantogamon was a pitiful sight to see. He was scalded with joy. He seized both letters and went into the village with them, stopping all who could read and forcing them to read the letters. In his belated joy, he bragged all through the village. Aha! What do you think of my Grishka? He raised his hand when the reader came to the passage where Pyotr described Gregor's exploit. He's the first to get the cross in our village, he declared proudly. Jealously taking the letter, he thrust it into the lining of his cap and went off in search of another reader. Even Sergei Mokhov, who saw him through his shop window, came out, taking off his cap. Come in for a minute, Prokofievich, he invited him. Inside, he squeezed the old man's fist in his own puffy white hand and said, Well, I congratulate you, I congratulate you. You must be proud to have such a son. I've just been reading about his exploit in the newspapers. Is it in the papers? Pantelyamon's face twisted spasmodically. Yes, I've just read it. Mokhov took a packet of the finest Turkish tobacco down from a shelf and poured out some expensive chocolates into a bag without troubling to weigh them. Handing the tobacco and sweets to Pantelyemon, he said, When you send Grigor Pantelyevich a parcel, send him a greeting and these from me. My God, what an honor for Grishka. All the village is talking about him. I've lived to see, the old man muttered as he went down the steps of the shop. He blew his nose violently and wiped the tears from his cheek with his sleeve, thinking, I'm getting old. Tears come too easily. Ah, Pantelyemon Prokofievich, what has life done with you? You were as hard as a flint once. You could carry two and a half hundredweight on your back as easily as a feather, but now Grishka's business has upset you a little. As he limped along the street, pressing the bag of chocolates to his chest, Again his thought fluttered around Grigor like a lapwing over a marsh, and the words of Pyotr's letter wandered through his mind. Grigor's father-in-law, Korshinov, was coming along the road, and he called to Pantelyemon. Hey, Pantelyemon, stop a minute. The two men had not met since the day war was declared. A cold, constrained relationship had arisen between them after Grigor left home, 
Mirren was annoyed with Natalia for humbling herself to Gregor and for forcing her father to endure a similar humiliation. Mirren went right up to Pantaliemon and thrust out his oak-colored hand. How are you? Thanks be to God. Been shopping? Pantaliemon shook his head. These are gifts to our hero. Sergei Platonovich read about his deeds in the papers and has sent him some chocolates and tobacco. Do you know the tears came to his eyes, the old man boasted, staring fixedly into Miran's face in the attempt to discover what impression his words had made. The shadows gathered under Miran's eyelashes, giving his face a ludicrously smiling twist. So, he croaked and turned to cross the street. Pantoliemon hurried after him, opening the bag and trembling with anger. Here, try these chocolates. They're as sweet as honey, he said spitefully. Try them. I offer them in my son's name. Your life is none too sweet, so you can have one. And your son may earn such an honor some day, but then he may not. Don't pry into my life. I know best what it's like. Just try one. Do me the favor, Pantoliemon bowed with exaggerated affability, running in front of Mirren. We're not used to sweets, Mirren pushed away his hand, and we're not used to breaking our teeth on others' hospitality. It was hardly decent of you to go begging alms for your son. If you're in need, you can come to me. Our Natalia's eating your bread. We could have given to you in your poverty. Don't you tell those lies. No one has ever begged for alms in our family. You're too proud, much too proud. Maybe it is because you were rich that your daughter came to us. Wait, Miran said authoritatively. There's no point in our quarreling. I didn't stop you to have a quarrel. I've some business I want to talk over with you. We have no business to talk over. Yes, we have. Come on. He seized Pantoliemon's sleeve and dragged him into a side street. They walked out of the village onto the step. Well, what's the business? Pantoliemon asked in more amiable tones. He glanced sidelong at Korshinov's face, turning the edges of his long coat under him. Miran sat down on the bank of a ditch and pulled out his old tobacco pouch. You know, Prokofievich, the devil knows why you went for me like a quarrelsome cock. As it is, things aren't too good, are they? I want to know, his voice changed to a hard, rough tone, how long your son is going to make a laughingstock of Natalia. Tell me that. You must ask him about it, not me. I've nothing to ask him. You're the head of your house, and I'm talking to you. Pantoliemon squeezed the chocolate still held in his hand, and the sticky mess oozed through his fingers. He wiped his palm on the brown clay of the bank and silently began to make a cigarette, opening the packet of Turkish tobacco and pouring out a pinch. Then he offered the packet to Miran. Korshinov took it without hesitation and made a cigarette from the tobacco intended for Grigor. Above them a cloud hung its white, sumptuous breast, and a tender flying web stretched up towards it, fluttering in the wind. The day declined to its close. The September stillness lulled peacefully and with inexpressible sweetness. The sky had lost its full summer gleam and was a hazy dove color. Over the ditch apple leaves, carried God knows whence, rustled their exuberant purple. The road disappeared over the undulating crest of the hills, in vain did it beckon to pass along it, beyond the emerald, dreamily uncertain horizon, into unseen space. Held down to their huts and their daily round, the people pined in their labor, exhausted their strength on the threshing floor, and the road, a deserted, yearning track, flowed across the horizon into the unseen. The wind trod along it with aimless elegance, stirring up the dust. This is weak tobacco. It's like grass, Miran said, emitting a cloud of smoke from his mouth. It's weak, but it's pleasant, Pantoliemon half agreed. Give me an answer, Pantoliemon, Korshinov asked in a quieter tone, putting out his cigarette. Griegor never says anything about it in his letters. He's wounded now. What will come after, I don't know. Maybe he'll be killed, and then what? But how can it go on like this? Miran blinked distractedly and miserably. There she is, neither maid nor wife nor honest widow, and it's a disgrace. If I had known it was going to turn out like this, I'd never have allowed the matchmakers across my threshold. Ah, Pantoliemon, Pantoliemon, each is sorry for his own child. 
Blood is thicker than water. How can I help it? Pantolyemon replied with restrained frenzy. Tell me, do you think I'm glad my son left home? Was it any gain to me? Write to him, Miran dictated, and the dust streaming from under his hands into the ditch kept time with his words. Let him say once for all, He's got a child by that, and he'll have a child by this, Korshinov shouted, turning livid. Can you treat a human being like that, eh? Huh? Once she's tried to kill herself and is maimed for life, and you can trample her into the grave, eh? Huh? His heart, his heart, Miran hissed, tearing at his breast with one hand, tugging at Pantolyemon's coattails with the other. Is it a wolf's heart he's got? Pantolyemon wheezed and turned away. The woman's devoted to him, and there's no other life for her without him. Is she a serf in your service? Miran demanded. She's better off with us than with you. Hold your tongue, Pantolyemon shouted as he rose from the bank. They parted without a word of farewell, and went off in different directions. When swept out of its normal channel, life scatters into innumerable streams. It is difficult to foresee which it will take in its treacherous and winding course, where today it flows in shallows like a rivulet over sandbanks, so shallow that the shoals are visible. Tomorrow it will flow richly and fully. Suddenly Natalia came to the decision to go to Aksinia at Yagodnaya and to ask, to beseech her to return Gregor to her. For some reason it seemed to Natalia that everything depended on Aksinia, and if she asked her, Gregor would return, and with him her own former happiness. She did not stop to consider whether this was possible or how Aksinia would receive her strange request. Driven on by subconscious motives, she sought to act upon her decision as quickly as possible. At the end of the month, a letter arrived from Gregor. After messages to his father and mother, he sent his greeting and regards to Natalia. Whatever the reason inciting him to this, it was the stimulus Natalia required, and she made ready to go to Yagodnoya the very next Sunday. "'Where are you off to, Natalia?' Dunya asked, watching as she attentively studied her features in the scrap of looking-glass. "'I'm going to visit my people,' Natalia lied, and blushed as she realized for the first time that she was going towards a great humiliation, a terrible moral test. You might have an evening out with me just for once, Daria suggested. Come this evening, won't you? I don't know, but I don't think so. You little thorn. Our turn only comes when our husbands are away, Daria winked, and stooped to examine the embroidered hem of her new pale blue skirt. Daria's attitude to Natalia had changed of late, and their relations had grown simple and friendly. The dislike which she felt for the younger woman was gone and the two, different in every respect, lived together amicably. Daria had altered considerably since Piotr's departure. Unrest showed in her eyes, her movements, and carriage. She arrayed herself more diligently on Sundays and came back late in the evening to complain to Natalia, It's woeful, God's truth. They've taken away all the suitable Cossacks and left only lads and old men in the village. Well, what difference does that make to you? Well, there's nobody to lark about with of an evening. And with cynical frankness, she asked Natalia, How can you bear it, my dear, so long without a Cossack? Shame on you. Haven't you any conscience? Natalia blushed. Don't you feel any desire? It's clear you do. Daria laughed, and the arches of her brows quivered. Why should I hide it? I'd throw any old man on his back this very minute. Just think, it's two months since Piotr went... You're laying up sorrow for yourself, Daria. Shut up, you respectable old woman. We know you quiet ones. You would never admit it. I've nothing to admit. Daria gave her a ludicrous sidelong glance and bit her lips. The other day, Timothy Manitsev, the Ottoman's son, sat down beside me. I could see he was afraid to begin. Then he quietly slipped his hand under my arm, and his hand was trembling. I just waited and said nothing. But I was getting angry. If he had been a lad now, but he's only a snot. Sixteen years old, not a day more. I sat without speaking, and he pawed and pawed and whispered, Come along to our shed. Then I gave him one. She laughed merrily. I jumped up, 
Oh, you this and that, you yellow-necked whelp. Do you think you can wheedle me like that? When did you wet the bed last? I gave him a fine dressing down. Natalia went out. Daria overtook her in the porch. You'll open the door for me tonight, she asked. I expect I shall stop the night with my people. Daria thoughtfully scratched her nose with her comb and shook her head. Oh, all right. I didn't want to ask Dunya, but I see I shall have to. Natalia told Ilinichna she was going to visit her people and went into the street. The wagons were rattling away from the market in the square, and the villagers were coming from church. She turned up a side lane and hurriedly climbed the hill. At the top she turned and looked back. The village lay flooded in sunlight. The little lime-washed huts were white, and the sun glittered on the steep roof of the mill, making the sheet iron shine like molten ore. Yagodnaya also had lost men, torn away by the war. Benyamin and Tikhon had gone, and the place was still sleepier, more dreary and isolated than ever. Aksinya waited on the general in Benyamin's place, while fat-bottomed Lucaria took over all the cooking and fed the fowls. There was only one new face, an old Cossack named Nikitich, who had been taken on as coachman. This year old Lisnitsky sowed less, and supplied some twenty horses for army remounts, leaving only three or four for the needs of the estate. He passed his time shooting bustards and hunting with the Barzois. Aksinya received only brief, infrequent letters from Gregor, informing her that so far he was well. He had grown stronger, or else he did not want to tell her of his weakness, for he never let slip any complaint that he found active service difficult and dreary. His letters were cold, as though he had written them because he felt he had to, and only in one did he write, All the time at the front, and I'm fed up with fighting and carrying death on my back. In every letter he asked after his daughter, telling Oxenia to write about her. Oxenia seemed to bear the separation bravely. All her love for Gregor was poured out on her daughter, especially after she became convinced that the child was really his. Life gave irrefragable proofs of that. The girl's dark, ruddy hair was replaced by a black, curly growth. Her eyes changed to a dark tint and elongated in their slits. With every day she grew more and more like her father. Even her smile was Gregor's. Now Oxenia could see him beyond all doubt in the child, and her feeling for it deepened. The days passed on, and at the end of one, a caustic bitterness settled in Oxenia's breast. Anxiety for the life of her beloved pierced her mind like a sharp needle. It left her neither day nor night. Restrained during the hours of labor, it burst all dams at night, and she tossed in an inarticulate cry, in tears, biting her hand to avoid wakening the child with her sobs, and to kill her mental with a physical pain. She wept her tears into a napkin, thinking in her childish naivete, Grishka must feel through his child how I yearn for him. After such nights, she arose in the morning as though she had been beaten unmercifully. All her body ached. Little silver hammers knocked incessantly in her veins, and sorrow lurked in the corners of her swollen lips. The nights of yearning aged Oxenia. On the Sunday of Natalia's visit, she had given her master his breakfast, and was standing on the steps when she saw a woman approaching the gate. The eyes beneath the white kerchief seemed strangely familiar. The woman opened the gate and entered the yard. Aksinya turned pale as she recognized Natalia. She went slowly to meet her. A heavy layer of dust had settled on Natalia's shoes. She halted, her large, labor-scarred hands hanging lifelessly at her sides, and breathed heavily, trying to straighten her mutilated neck. "'I want to see you, Aksinya,' she said, running her dry tongue over her lips. Aksinya gave a swift glance at the windows of the house and silently led Natalia into her room. She closed the door, and standing in the middle of the room with her hands under her apron, took charge of the situation, asking stealthily, almost in a whisper. What have you come for? I'd like a drink, Natalia asked, staring heavily around the room. Oxenia waited. Natalia began to speak, with difficulty raising her voice. 
You've taken my husband from me. Give me my Gregor back. You have broken my life. You see how I am. Husband to you? Aksinia grated her teeth, and the words came sharply and freely like raindrops on stone. Husband to you? Who are you asking? Why did you come? You've thought of it too late, too late. Laughing caustically, her whole body swaying, Aksinia went right up to Natalia. She sneered as she stared in the face of her enemy. There she stood, the lawful but abandoned wife, humiliated, crushed with misery. She who had come between Aksinia and Gregor, separating them, causing a bloody pain like a heavy stone in Aksinia's heart. And while she had been wearing herself out with mortal longing, this other one, this Natalia, had been caressing Gregor and no doubt laughing at her, the unsuccessful, forsaken lover. And you've come to ask me to give him up? Aksinia panted. You snake in the grass. You took Gregor away from me first. You knew he was living with me. Why did you marry him? I only took back my own. He's mine. I have a child by him, but you... With stormy hatred, she stared into Natalia's eyes, and waving her arms wildly, poured out a boiling torrent of words. Grishka's mine, and I'll give him up to no one. He's mine. Mine, do you hear? Mine. Clear out, you shameless bitch. You're not his wife. You want to rob a child of its father? And why didn't you come before? Well, why didn't you come before? Natalia went sideways to the bench and sat down, drooping her head and covering her face with her palms. You left your husband. Don't shout like this, she answered. Except for Grishka, I haven't any husband. No one, nowhere in the whole world. Feeling an anger that could not find vent raging within her, Aksinia gazed at the strand of black hair that had slipped from under Natalia's kerchief. Does he need you? she demanded. Look at your twisted neck. And do you think he longs for you? He left you when you were well, and is he likely to yearn for you as you are now? I won't give Gregor up. That's all I have to say. Clear out. Aksinia grew ferocious in defense of her nest. She could see that, despite the slightly crooked neck, Natalia was as good-looking as before. Her cheeks and lips were fresh, untouched by time, whilst her own eyes were lined with furrows, and all because of Natalia. Do you think I had any hope of getting him back by asking? Natalia raised her eyes, drunk with suffering. Then why did you come? Aksinia asked. My yearning drove me on. Awakened by the voices, Aksinia's daughter stirred in the bed and broke into a cry. The mother took up the child and sat down with her face to the window. Trembling in every limb, Natalia gazed at the infant. A dry spasm clutched her throat. Gregor's eyes stared at her inquisitively from the baby's face. Weeping and swaying, she walked out into the porch. Aksinia did not see her off. A minute or two later, Sashka came into the room. Who was that woman? he asked, evidently half-guessing. Someone from our village. Natalia walked back towards Tatarsk for a couple of miles, and then lay down under a wild thorn. Crushed by her yearning, she lay thinking of nothing. Gregor's black, morose eyes, staring out of a child's face, were continually before her own eyes. Chapter 7 so vivid that it was almost a blinding pain, the night after the battle remained forever imprinted in Gregor's memory. He returned to consciousness some time before dawn. His hands stirred among the prickly stubble, and he groaned with the pain that filled his head. With an effort he raised his hand, drew it up to his brow, and felt his blood-clotted hair. He touched the flesh wound with his finger. Then, grating his teeth, he lay on his back, Above him the frost-nipped leaves of a tree rustled mournfully with a glassy tinkle. The black silhouettes of the branches were clearly outlined against the deep blue background of the sky, and stars glittered among them. Griagor gazed unwinkingly, and the stars seemed to him like strange bluish-yellow fruits hanging from the twigs. Realizing what had happened to him, and conscious of an invincible, approaching horror, he crawled away on all fours, grinding his teeth. The pain played with him, threw him down headlong. He seemed to be crawling an immeasurably long time. He forced himself to look back. 
The tree stood out blackly some fifty paces away. Once he crawled across a corpse, resting his elbows on the dead man's hard, sunken belly. He was sick with loss of blood, wept like a babe, and chewed the dewy grass to avoid losing consciousness. Close to an overturned case of shells, he managed to get onto his feet and stood a long time swaying, then started to walk. His strength began to return. He stepped out more firmly and was even able to take his bearings by the great bear, moving in an easterly direction. At the edge of the forest, he was halted by a sudden warning shout, Stop or I'll fire! He heard the rattle of a revolver and looked in the direction of the sound. A man was reclining by a pine tree. Who are you? he asked, listening to the sound of his voice as though it were another's. A Russian? My God, come here. The man by the pine slipped to the ground. Grigor went to him. Bend down, the man ordered him. I can't. Why not? I shall fall and not be able to get up again. I'm wounded in the head. What regiment are you? The Twelfth Don Cossack. Help me, Cossack. I shall fall, Your Excellency, Grigor replied, recognizing the officer by his epaulets. Give me your hand at least. Grigor stooped and helped the officer to rise, and they went off together. But with every step the officer hung more heavily on his arm. As they rose out of a dell, he seized Grigor by the sleeve and said, Let me drop, Cossack. I've got a wound right across the stomach. He swooned, but Grigor dragged him along, falling and rising again and again. Twice he dropped his burden and left it, but each time he returned, lifted it, and stumbled on as if in a waking sleep. At eleven o'clock they were picked up by a patrol and taken to a dressing station. Grigor secretly left the station the very next day. Once on the road, he tore the bandage from his head and walked along, waving the blood-soaked bandage in his relief. "'Where have you come from?' his company commander asked him in amazement when he turned up at regimental headquarters. "'I've returned to duty, Your Excellency,' he replied. His company had halted in Kamienka Strumilova for two days and were now preparing to advance again. Grigor found the house in which the Cossacks of his troop were quartered and went to see his horse. His towels and some underlinen were missing from his saddlebags. Stolen before my very eyes, Grigor, Misha Koshevoy admitted guiltily. The infantry were quartered here and they stole them. Well, I can keep them, damn them. Only I want to bandage my head. Uryupin came into the shed, where they were standing. He held out his hand as though the quarrel between him and Grigor had never occurred. Hello, Melyukov, so you're still alive, he exclaimed. More or less. Your head's all bleeding. Let me have a look. He forced back Grigor's head and snorted. Why did you let them cut your hair off? The doctors would have made a fine mess of you. Let me heal you. Without waiting for Grigor's consent, he drew a cartridge out of his cartridge case, broke the bullet open, and poured the black powder into his hand. Misha, find me a spider's web, he ordered. With the point of his saber, Kashavoy scraped up a web and handed it to Uryupin. With the same saber, Uryupin dug up some earth and, mixing it with the web and the powder, chewed it between his teeth. Then he plastered the sticky mess over the bleeding wound and smiled. It'll be all right again in three days, he declared. But here I am looking after you, and yet you would have killed me. Thank you for looking after me. But if I had killed you, I'd have had one sin the less on my conscience. What's the wound like? It's a cut half an inch deep. You won't forget it in a hurry. The Austrians don't sharpen their swords, and you'll have a scar for the rest of your life. They turned to leave the shed. Grigor's bay horse whinnied after him, turning up the whites of his eyes. He pined after you, Grigor, Koshevoy nodded to the horse. He wouldn't eat, but was whinnying all the time. When I crawled away, I kept calling him, Grigor said in a thick voice. I was sure he wouldn't leave me and I knew it wouldn't be easy for a stranger to catch him.